2 Peter chapter 1, actually it's 3 to, 3 to 11. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten what he's been cleansed from, his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich reward into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The reading of God's Word. Where do bad rainbows go? Prism! <laughs> It's okay, though, it's only a uh, light sentence. <laughs> Given time to reflect. <laughs> yeah, well, I got it out of our system. We're going to go up from here now. <laughs> Let's pray. And now, God, lift the words that you've given us through the prophets over the ages with your spirit and plant them in our hearts. Guide and direct. Open our eyes, open our hearts to you and you only. And for the one who's preaching, that you forgive his sins. You know they are many. And use them anyway. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, we're looking at 2 Peter um, chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. And we will be focusing on the fact that we can be sure of our calling and election, which are theological terms for our daily response to God by discussing God's divine power to participate in his promises to us, focus on, uh, focusing on the eternal life promise as an example, then on God's training program for us as believers, and then focusing on God's welcome to heaven upon our arrival, the retirement package we all want. You know there are many promises of God within the Bible. So which promise do we really want? Probably all of them, but like I said. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises that we might participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world. For the sake of time and focus, we're going to single out, as I said, one promise in which God calls us to participate as believers. And if I'm talking too fast, feel free to wave me down, okay? Thank you. I appreciate that. John 3.16 is a promise right from Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes has eternal life. So where does eternal life start? In heaven? After we die? Now that makes it a future promise, making heaven and eternal life somewhat irrelevant to us here and now. It's almost like not having the promise of eternal life until we die. But if we believe Jesus in the here and now, well on earth, and follow him in this earthly life as believers, doesn't eternal life have more than a distant impact on us? Or shouldn't it at any rate? Well, let's apply and see. 
Divine power or authority of God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Think about this for a minute. Where's God? In heaven. That's easy. Where does eternal life start? Where is it lived out? We're tempted to say, in heaven. Makes sense. But Jesus' promise in Matthew 18 is, where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. What if, what if, what if we entered heaven before our death and we didn't even realize it? Are we not at least two or three gathered in Jesus' name this morning here at Lambert? Well, then Jesus would be here with us. Does Jesus leave heaven to come and be present with us? Or does heaven open up? With Jesus still present among us, and our Father, who is in heaven, extending his kingdom outward and over us, earthly believers with heavenly eternal life. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We all just pray for it. Look around this morning. Take a quick peek. It's okay. Everyone's doing it. As we gather in Jesus' name, heaven has opened up. And we are in the presence of Jesus, who is sitting at the right hand of God, the throne room of heaven. In the book of Job, angels line up to present themselves before God. We don't. That's, that's pretty good. That's really good. But we go in, in prayer, in gathering in Jesus' name, in groups as a, a little as two or three. May I dare say? We are in heaven now. Don't pick up rocks. <laughs> Just hear me out. We have been given eternal life, which starts in heaven. As we enter heaven in prayer and in corporate worship, like church. So, we are at church this morning with those we see, but as Jesus is among us, we are also at church in heaven. Thus, with those who have died and are with the Lord, as the Apostle Paul writes, absent from the body, present with the Lord. It means we are gathered in Jesus' presence with loved ones who have gone on before us. Mothers, fathers, spouses, siblings, friends. And we're all still going to church together. Eternal life. This is how we participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires through God's promises. Our desire is Jesus, our desire is heaven, and we get ourselves busy for heaven, so we get away from, we're too busy doing the stuff we should do, we don't have time to do the stuff we shouldn't do. And I recognize as we look around, we're hoping that heaven's a little bit better than perhaps the sanctuary of Langford, although it is pretty. But if we got just a taste, isn't that amazing to think about that? And that, as Jesus is here with us, we are gathered, gathered with the saints who have gone on before us. We're still singing with those we love, worshiping God with those we love. And that is how we participate in the divine nature. On this promise of eternal life, we regularly go to heaven. 
due to the gift of eternal life from God through Jesus in prayer and in corporate worship like this. So now that we're aware of the role eternal life is playing in our earthly lives, now that we are engaged in at least one of the many promises of God, what do we do next? We train. During COVID, I got on my bicycle. Now, I'm a hockey player. Biking was one of those things you did as a kid to get around because you didn't have a driver's license. And you do when you're older because the car broke down and you need to get to the store. But I got out there on that bike and I started riding. I got a riding partner, Jimmy Bergsma. He's not here so I can pick on him. <laughs> now, if you know Jim, Jim is a tall Dutch guy, fairly athletic looking, thin. Gets on a bike, he can pedal a bike, you know, like the edge of a knife. He cuts through the air. I, on the other hand, cut through the air like a broad brick wall. <laughs> I had the aerodynamic jet stream of a parachute opening. <laughs> and as we started to ride down the path together, I started to realize that this wasn't just a kid's toy anymore. I started learning. I started realizing. I started realizing if you don't have that many desserts between rides, the second ride is not so hard. I hate that truth, but it's true. I found that if you start going up a hill, guaranteed the wind will blow down the hill. And you have to make a choice. Are you going to do it or not? Are you going to get off and walk up in front of everybody, or are you going to ride this one out? I learned how to fix the bike. I learned to prepare for the ride. I learned so much, but I learned so much about me by participating. And that is really important. I've been able to take some of those lessons that I learned and put them in other areas of life. It's been great. So I say that before we go into the training program God has for us, because if you go into it, you've got to participate. This is not one of those spectator sports. This is, this is really good. But I'll continue. So for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. Ever heard someone say something like, I sure do hope the big guy upstairs gives me credit for trying and when my time comes, he's got room for me in the big hotel in the sky. What does that even mean? <laughs> given the fact that God's divine power and authority has already given us the answers about his promise, including eternal life in heaven. This type of uh, pseudo-quasi-religious thinking, uh, religious wish for the non-religious, is so ineffective and unproductive in a person's life. It's, it really... It's just an excuse for being ignorant or lazy. God has already told us the answer and has given us a training program to keep us from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of Jesus. So what's it to be productive and effective? Well, like oxygen masks in airplanes, we put ours on first before helping others. If we can't look after our own spiritual training and our own spiritual preparation, for our own production and effectiveness for earthly living, how are we ever really going to help anybody else? Here's what I mean. Verse five, make every effort to add to our faith, which is required first, is a belief of, that God exists. Faith out of Hebrews 11. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we don't see. Add to our faith goodness. Goodness. And this unfortunately becomes a deal breaker in the faith journey for too many people. We interpret being good very poorly. A geek, a killjoy, goody two shoes. I mean, we've got a whole bunch of names for it. Person running around pointing out all the not good things while often missing the bigger picture. Don't do that. That's not good. Don't do that. That's not good. 
Not good. Don't do. There's not enough aspirin in the world for the headache that kind of person creates. Is there? And if they don't go away, you're almost tempted to wash the aspirin down with hard liquor just to deal with these people. We don't want that. You ever thought that maybe even God doesn't want that? It's a stage that we all pass through, but honestly, the quicker pass, the better, correct? If we take this attitude of being good and apply it elsewhere, how does it sound? Maybe we've approached a coach, a sports coach, a club coordinator, a choir director, a band, and asked to join, or at least try out. What do we get asked? Are you any good? Are you any good? What's that mean? Good. Good how? Good when? Brush my teeth before bed so now I'm an excellent hockey player, or a good hockey player? Put my shoes away in the closet like I, like I was told to do, so now I'm a good guitarist, ready for the band? This question of goodness pertains to what we are bringing to the group in our request to join. Can we sing well enough? Can, are we good enough to participate in this part? Are we good enough to play sports at this level for this team? God is not equipping us for irrelevant good. He is equipping us to be people who are good at faith. Hebrews 11, I go back to that one. Sure of what we hope for, certain of what we don't see. Did we see God in that situation? Do we believe in God? Is God in that situation in our lives? Not just Sunday morning, but at work, was God there? At home, was God there? In our neighborhood, wherever we might be, do we see God at work among people around us? In our own life, are we good at faith? Some call it coincidence, others refer to it as a divine appointment. Do we see by faith God's hand at work in our lives and in the other lives around us? The more we practice faith, the certainty of what we don't see, the good, gooder we get at it. I know, better would have been the better word to choose, but I didn't want to drop good too quick. We get gooder at our faith. That's the goodness that God's seeking in us. Good at faith. Because when we believe something is possible, and we get good at it, we gain, wait for it, wait for it. When you get good at it, you get knowledge. <coughs> like it says in verse 5, add to goodness knowledge. It's almost like God knows something about sequences of life and living it, eh? And in verses 6 and 7, as we gain knowledge, we develop self-control, which aids us in perseverance, which helps us deliver or develop godliness, which gives us reason for kindness, which allows us to love. And why this pattern? Because it keeps us from being so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. If we possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep us from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to change our interpretation of goodness, not stall our faith on a misguided idea or definition. Be good at your faith. You want to be good at brushing your teeth? You want to be good because of? Fine, but get good at your faith so that you can get the knowledge of faith, so that you can move forward and the self-control, that you can move forward in the perseverance. Like riding a bike up a hill. You're either going to do it or you're not. Persevere. Just say it. It's a lifelong work, managing and increasing in these character traits, participating in God's promises to us, and the eternal life promise, the example we were focusing on this morning, we all hope for a long time to practice until such a time as our work on earth is done. 
I mean, really, we're not expecting the cat show today. We'd like to practice this a little longer, I'm sure. Okay, good. And we want more time to practice until our work here is done, until we die or retire from living on Earth. And that's the retirement package we all want. In verse 10, for if you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we discussed earlier, by God's divine power and authority, we participate in his promises in our earthly life. God said we can. He's the final authority. We can do this. And we can do it well. Just because people sign up, just because people follow Jesus, doesn't mean you have to give up cool factor. You don't have to be the geek. You can actually do this well. We just stop trying sometimes. Be good at your faith. And in this, we get tastes of heaven. We get glimpses of what it will be like. But it's only glimpses. It's not what it actually is. But in our retirement from earthly living, we experience the whole thing. We get it all. So what's the retirement package? What's the big one? It's, it's going to heaven. But there's entering heaven through our death or, no, I'll just stick here. Entering into heaven and receiving a warm welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A warm welcome. Think about that. High fives. Fist bumps. You're here, man. You're here. <laughs> You're here. Fist bumps. Chest bumps. I mean, did, did you not hold out all life for this? This is exciting. Maybe not. Maybe we should sneak in. We get a warm welcome. There's no sneaking, no cowering, no surprises. No, I just want to get in, sit down, take my jacket off, and hopefully God will let me stay. None of that. A warm welcome. Do I need to discuss heaven? Jesus says, No eye has seen, nor ear heard what is prepared for those who love him in heaven. Now, I go back to my first point and say, we're, we're in heaven. And I understand that we really don't see, no eye has seen it, no ear has heard what's in heaven, what God has prepared for us. But it's the glimpse, the fellowship. This is a cool church. I mean, you may not understand just how cool it is, but this is a great place. And the fellowship here is just amazing. And if this is just a touch of what heaven's going to be like, fist bumps to everybody, man. This is awesome. This is what it's going to feel like. Only better. Because we'll see everything. So, do I need to discuss heaven? No. It's good. Do I have any arguments on that? It's very good. Heaven is very good. Very, very, very good. We don't have to have that discussion. And hopefully, as good as it is, it's still some time in the future for us. There's some living to do down here. Some training to do down here. Some being earthly good and heavenly minded down here to go. And upon our retirement from this life, we will enter the presence of God, the presence of the saints who have gone on before us, and the presence of the angels who watch over us, which we will have done countless times before on mornings such as these, at churches such as Langford. Only on that day, we will remain permanent. forever in fullness. As Jesus promised in John 14, in my Father's house there are many rooms, and I go to prepare one for you, so that you may be with me. You don't have to hope that the big guy in the sky has got a room in his sky-high hotel for you. You can ask. You can get in some training. You can 
expect and work towards a rich welcome. God's offering it. He paid the price. You're not doing anything to get to heaven. You're just getting the, you're just putting the little check marks in the boxes of all the decorations you want when you get there. So as stated in verse 10, be eager. Continue to show that get up and go to ensure our calling and election so that we, by God's divine power, will have trained well, lived well, will be known by the angels and the saints as frequent, frequent visitors to heaven in prayer and in worship and having lived out God's promise. Be welcomed home richly by God himself, by name, the Almighty. That's ours, if you'd like it. Let's pray. And so, God, you who made the stars, you have coordinated all the planets. They're not crashing into each other. They are in orbit because you said and set them in orbit. And so in our lives, we know that if you can do that much out there, there's just that much more you can do here in our lives and around our lives. And so, God, we ask that you would help us to remember it's you who said these things. It's your divine power that has called us and enabled us to be participants in your promises. All your promises, not just eternal life, but thank you especially for eternal life, practiced here and now. Thank you for the training plan that you've given us. Help us to grasp it and move forward in it. And help us set our eyes ahead. It's going to be a great day. We're not in a rush. We want to live by faith, Lord. But when we see each other, it would be great that you are yelling our names with anticipation and just as excited that we're there for you as we are there for us. Honor and glorify yourselves in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.